start by introducing our presenters tonight, Drs. Uh, Lynette Johns and Stephanie Wu. Dr. Uh, Dr. Johns is a research associate at Harvard Medical School Department of Ophthalmology. She exclusively fits scleral lenses at Mass Eye and Ear Infirmary at the Waltham office. She is a co-author and uh, editor of, uh, along with Melissa Barnett, of the textbook Contemporary Scleral Lenses, Theory and Application. She has public, published and speaks internationally on scleral and specialty contact lenses, as well as severe ocular surface disease. Our other presenter, Dr. Stephanie Wu, was born and raised in Lake Havasu, Arizona, graduated magna cum laude from University of Arizona, and then with honors from the Southern California College of Optometry. She completed a cornea and contact lens residency at the University of Missouri, St. Louis, where she was trained to fit highly irregular corneas. She was the recipient of the Gas Permeable Lens Institute Award for Clinical Excellence and also the John R. Griffin Award for Excellence in Vision Therapy. She's a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and the uh, Scleral Lens Education Society. She is uh, she's authored Gas Permeable Lens Expert columns in uh, Review of Contact Lenses, as well as several articles for the Contact Lens and Cornea section of the AOA. And she's co-authored the GP Insights column for Contact Lens Spectrum. She's an active GPLI advo advisory board member and currently serves as the president of the Scleral Lens Education Society. She enjoys lecturing around the world on the subject of contact lenses and anterior segment disease. Dr. Wu owns Havasu Eye Center, Parker Vision Care, and Blythe Vision Care. In her spare time, she's an avid wine collector and a level two sommelier. With that, uh, I'm pleased to turn it over to uh, Dr. Wu. Thank you, Drew, and uh, the Scleral Lens Society really thanks Dr. Drew Biondo. He's been amazing with all of these webinars, and he he does it all for free, and he's got a new baby at home, and, and we just can't say enough great things about you, Drew, so thank you th so much. And I apologize, my uh, biography was a little bit off as far as I'm now the immediate past president of the Scleral Lens Society. That's my fault uh, for not changing that. But anyway, thank you all for joining us this evening. I'm really, really excited to present with my really good friend, Lynette Johns, who has been such an amazing mentor to me and a friend and just somebody that I respect deeply. And I look up to her a lot. So when we got to do this lecture together, I was absolutely thrilled. And the reason this lecture came to be was because a lot of practitioners were asking questions in a lot of the different lectures and the different workshops that we put on about different diameters. There's so many different diameters to choose nowadays, and they wanted to find out which ones to use for different conditions. So we thought it would be fun to do kind of a little debate on large versus small diameter scleral lenses. Um, Dr. Dr. Johns is going to be representing the the large, and you know she's super familiar with large diameter scleral lenses. She's an expert, and then I will kind of discuss some of the small diameter scleral lens pros and cons. So then that gives you a large picture on when to use the different designs. And with that, I'll pass it over to my esteemed colleague. Dr. Lynette Johns. Thank you, Dr. Wu. I appreciate uh, this invitation from the Scleral Lens Education Society and for everything that they do do for us, supporting us. Um, so uh, let's get started. So one of the things that I found over time was kind of uh, confusing when it came to scleral lenses was the terminology because uh, initially this was I think back in 2010 we had corneal scleral, semi-scleral, mini-scleral, full scleral, large scleral, small scleral, it ran the gamut and here you can see that the diameters uh, were classified as uh, uh, the like corneal scleral was classified between 12.9 to 13.5 and the semi-scleral was and these were harsh delineations. And what you'll see is later, um, in the next slide, the Scleral Lens Education Society started to uh, emphasize more the class of, of lens and where it bears. Because by doing it by diameter, it doesn't truly uh, end up showing what uh, the bearing pattern of the lens is. For example, there's really three classes of large diameter 
gas permeable lenses. The corneal lens, which rests completely on the cornea, and these can be large. Um, they can be 11 millimeters or larger. Uh, corneal scleral lenses, these lenses uh, rest both on the cornea and on the sclera, and we will not be covering these lenses today. And lastly, the full scleral lens, which bears completely on the, well, it's, we say sclera, obviously it's the conjunctiva overlying the sclera, but um, at the same time, it does not touch the cornea or limbus at all. So when you have uh, what it was further subdivided into mini scleral and large scleral based on the HVID. So What's important in when we're when we're talking about these lenses and where to get started, we have to take into account the visible iris diameter. So there's a variety of ways of measuring it. And in the center, there's a HVID ruler, so horizontal visible iris diameter ruler. In the left, it's the Volk eye check, which actually is a way of taking a picture of the cornea and taking a bunch of measurements through that camera system. And on the right is simply taking, in this case, a diagonal iris diameter um, of a topography. And all of these are really important uh, when you're talking about HVID because the HVID matters, especially when fitting large diameter lenses. On the left, you can see we've got a patient with megalocornea, and on the right, you see a patient with microcorneas. And in these cases, if you were to use the old definition, say the corneal scleral lens that ends at a 13.5, well, on the right, if you put that lens on, it would be a fully vaulting scleral lens. So that's why the Scleral Lens Education Society found it very important to define Dia uh, the, the bearing pattern of a large diameter lens versus the diameter itself. So here's an example, and you can see that this is a corneal scleral lens. In the, on the upper left, it's too steep, and on the upper right, it's too flat, and in the bottom, it's optimal. So, um, but what's interesting here for a corneal scleral lens, which I'm not going to touch on much more, is that this is an 18.2 millimeter lens. So again, this kind of throws out those old definitions by diameter out the window because again, it depends on how the lens bears relative to the cornea, relative to the sclera, and diameter can be irrelevant, especially in a case like this. So with large diameter lenses, um, the best thing is just to not be intimidated. Here on the left, you can see just a corneal lens. Well, that's kind of a small diameter lens that we'll get to a little bit later. And then ultimately, in the, the next picture, that's not coming up yet, <laughs> you can see a uh, a little bit larger scleral lens, and that's a typical 23 millim lens. And these shouldn't intimidate you. In fact, I, I, I want to take some of the intimidation away by talking about these larger diameter scleral lenses. So in the early days, you can see Basically, they called these eye lenses. You can see they're taking their keratometry measurements and measuring the curvature, and they're applying these lenses. But what you'll be able to see on her eyes is how large they originally were. And they weren't putting the lens on <laughs> with solution. They were using the patient's own tears. So, um, and that's just a typical happy patient that we see in our office all the time. But again, it's really interesting to see how easily she could pop that lens out and as, as large of a lens that that was. So why choose these large diameter lenses? When we're looking at the diameter just as a profile, here you can see just a, a schematic of a mini scleral versus a a, a large diameter scleral, so a small scleral versus a large one. And you can see that there's just a small little foot plate or landing zone in the yellow mini scleral lens. Now, is that a problem? Not necessarily, but you'll go 
what, uh, when we get further into this discussion, you're going to see that maybe this isn't the best situation for all types of corneas. So when we look at the next slide, you can see that there's a benefit to bridging over a cornea. Here on the left, we have a uh, typical keratoconus uh, with an ectatic cone that's decentered inferiorly. And on the right, we've got a highly ectatic graft. And so in both of these cases, we want to make sure that we have enough plastic to bridge over the cornea completely and also land on the periphery. So the advantage of a large diameter scleral lens is going bigger, you can bridge over these large and highly ectatic corneas. So this is an example of a patient with keratoglobus, and you can see that the lens bears nicely onto the, uh, on the, uh, the, the conjunctiva, actually is showing a little bit of edge lift on the side, but this is a highly ectatic, globus patient and this lens diameter is a 19 millimeter lens to support the bridging over that cornea. When we're talking about increasing the sag height, you have to be very careful. If you have a patient, let's say he's too thin to be cross-linked and it, the patient's progressive, say for instance the patient's uh, early 20s, so you know the patient's going to progress. If you're to use use a small diameter lens, you kind of want to build some wiggle room so that the patient's ectasia can advance. Now, if we were to fit this patient with the, the shallower lens that you can see, when the patient <clears throat> develops more ectasia, we got to bridge that cornea more. So by going larger in the clearance, what's going to end up happening is at the landing zone, you might lose a little bit of your landing zone because it has to bridge up, it has to start bridging and, and arcing up to get that significant vaulting over the center of what you're trying to uh, bridge over, whether it's pellucid or keratoconus, um, whatever ectasia that is your obstacle. So as a result, you could end up having a much a more weight put onto a smaller surface area. And that's why I would advise fitting a little bit larger diameter to support increasing progressive sagittal depths in the future for these patients. So this is an example of a patient that has lens to cornea contact, and this is a graft. So the graft has an elevated graft host junction, and it requires peripheral clearance. So what's going to happen about the landing zone? If we had a small diameter lens, the landing zone is going to get eaten up by increasing steeply in the periphery to bridge over that peripheral elevation. And so in this case, it can turn into kind of a bottle cap appearance. And you'll see that the, the bottle cap is going to, the, the edges are going to sharply um, end up kind of bearing down on the uh, onto the sclera adjacent to the limbus. So that's just something we have to be very careful about. Now, this is one of the clinical pearls that I think uh, is very, very important. Central sag height might be affected by your base curve or it may not. So if you're thinking about steepening your base curve, in the left, you can see we steepen the base curve. What does that do? It gives us increased sagittal depth. But not all scleral lenses do that. So while you can steepen the base curve, it's going to have the same overall effect, but it depends on the manufacturer. Some lenses are held constant at the edge of the optic zone. So if you steepen the base curve, it will increase your sagittal depth. However, some designs actually hold the sagittal central sagittal depth point constant. So if you steepen the lens, it actually steepens and decreases your peripheral sagittal depth and doesn't do anything to increase your central sagittal depth. So this is where it's very important to talk to your uh, talk to your consultants with your laboratory and find out 
if I steepen my base curve, am I going to get more central sagittal depth or is it going to change my peripheral uh, sagittal depth? And that's just really imp important because in both cases, the base curve is steepened by the same amount, but it depends if the optic zone is held constant or the central sag point. Now, the other thing that's so important is the limbus, and that's really crucial and something we have to protect very dearly. And so in, this, uh, in, in these pictures, um, you can see that uh, in the upper right, there's an, a diagram of what the limbus is meant to be. But if we're looking at an OCT, um, Dr. Deng and Dr. Lee wrote this um, uh, this review basically evaluating um, the limbus using um, anterior segment OCT and how they're defining the limbal region because it is so vague is by taking a, a, a point from the end of the decimase membrane and connecting it to the end of Bowman's membrane and that's the anterior most region um, and central most region of the limbus to the peripheral region of the limbus that's defined by that triangular area, the scleral spur, and going straight up um, vertically to the surface of the cornea. So what I really want you to focus on is where that scleral spur is located in this OCT image because we're going to be looking at some images later on of some scleral lens fits and relative to the corneal topography of an OCT. And this is why we have to be very, very careful with the limbus whenever we're fitting a scleral lens, no matter what diameter we're using. So uh, Nixon et al. published this paper about using a uh, 14.6 millimeter diameter on 15 patients. The sag was at 300 microns and the wearing time was six hours. And 14 of these 15 patients ended up developing um, microbullae in the cornea. So here you can see uh, um, you've got uh, central, going central, the peripheral cornea. You can see these like stippling and these harsh demarcation lines. So they were suggesting that the epithelial bullae are likely mechanical. And again, you would have to agree with that because if you look at these pictures, you've got this perfect arcuate shape, especially in D. So that's clearly a junction of the lens bearing down somewhere on the cornea. And if we look at further pictures here, this is from the same article you can see that the peripheral cornea with this design of the lens was really bearing, um, was bearing down. So if you look, um, for instance, in uh, f the top left corner, you can see that that scleral anatomy, you, you can see where the scleral spur, that little triangular point, is right, uh, the scleral lens is bearing right on top of it. And that is the furthermost region of the scleral limbal, or sorry, the limbal area that was defined by Dr. Lee and Dr. Deng. So the, you can see that this small diameter design is really coming down harshly on the peripheral cornea. Now I'm not saying all small diameters are bad, it's just you have to be very careful how you're fitting over this area and you want to prevent these microbullae from forming. <clears throat> So this is a benefit of a large diameter lens. If you don't want to think about it, you don't want to worry about it, go large. This example, you can see the lens is filled with fluorescein, and you can see the leaching of the fluorescein onto the conjunctiva, and there's a nice halo. So you clearly know that the, the, the lens is vaulting over the limbus and beyond. So again, if you want to protect it, you can, because the benefit of large diameter scleral lenses, they allow enough plastic to bridge over even the most extreme corneas. Now, here's another example. In this example, um, the next example here is Tarian's marginal degeneration. So where you see this ring of lipokeratopathy, that's actually where the old corneal diameter should have been. But the degeneration ended up happening 
further and further back. So there is a significant amount of degeneration occurring about 15.5 to 16 millimeters past where the original corneal diameter used to be. So you wouldn't want to use that 14.6 diameter that was shown in the manuscript that was shown previously. You want to go at least 18, 19, 20 millimeters. And in this case, I think I fit a 22 millimeter lens on this particular patient. Another case you want to be very careful is patients with Salzman's nodular degeneration because these nodules while they say it's not an inflammatory condition, you have this pseudoterygium that forms. And the last thing I would want to do is tickle a nodule that could create more inflammation that may and have that pseudoterygium advance. So this way you can have central clearance, peripheral clearance, and get beyond and land where there's more landing zone past the, the limbus. Now another benefit is ocular surface protection. And in this case, this patient had severe dry eye, secondary Sjogren's syndrome, and I fit a 19.5 millimeter lens on her. And here, once we took the lens off, you can see the demarcation of the extensive conjunctival staining and where the lens was protecting the conjunctiva adjacent to the cornea. So you can have an enhanced uh, environment and protection with a large diameter lens and severe ocular surface disease. Now another bare, uh, uh, pr uh, protective uh, effect of a large diameter lens is the barrier effect from a rough environment. Now this patient um, is uh, in the upper left, you can see is has, she's got Stevens-Johnson syndrome, she had a graft, she's got cicatrizing disease, she's got trichiasis, she's got dystichiasis. Now in this situation, this the cicatrizing disease made her aperture small. So we had to go with a smaller diameter lens but we want to go as large as possible because on the picture on the upper right, this particular patient had a, 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 a 23 millimeter lens and we decided, well, we can go smaller just to make it easier for handling. And she wanted to go back to that 23 millimeter diameter lens. And she had Stevens-Johnson syndrome as well. And here you can see this scraping of the corneal surface and all that was was the time it took for me to take the lens off, uh, put fluorescein on the eye and take a look and take a picture and you could see the abrasions from the trichiasis and the dystichiasis just in that short period of time. So having as much plastic to form a barrier for these severe ocular surface disease patients can be very beneficial. In the bottom picture, you can see there's this keratinization of another Stevens-Johnson's patient, and that keratinization really is rough, and that scrapes across the cornea as well, and the conjunctival tissue. So you want to keep the eye less inflamed as possible, so preventing all of this microtrauma, not only on the cornea, but on the conjunctiva as well. The other thing, too, is there was this reported uh, application, a uh, TOSIS prop back in 1994, and you can see that there's like a lip developed. I would be very curious to hear what the uh, people who are really strong proponents of oxygen have to say about that amount of plastic propping the, the lid open, but you can see that this uh, probably couldn't be done with a small diameter scleral lens. So um, <clears throat> I have in fact fit large diameter lenses with a flat base curve and a little more sagittal depth than most people are comfortable with just to open the eyes more in patients with a ptosis. So it, uh, and again I followed them for at least five years and never saw any issues of neovascularization or swelling but again there's still a lot that we need to learn. So when you're fitting these large diameter scleral lenses, you just have to keep in mind that the, the, the shape of the eyes. And so um, it's really important to understand the, the scleral topography. 
So there's many ways that you can look at the scleral topography, but what's really exciting in our field now is scleral profilimetry. And here we've got the eye surface profiler on the left and the S map on the right. And these are ways to use scleral profilometry to map out the surface of the sclera. And the scleral lens shape study group looked at uh, the scleral profilometry using um, the S map, and they found that only 8% of, or five, less than less than 6% of patients had spherical uh, shapes to their sclera. So basically, um, a lot of asymmetric shapes to the sclera that uh, requires some peripheral tericity to be added into the lens. So here's an example of using a large diameter lens, and you can see uh, where there's the edge lift, and then you can see the fluorescein exchange. So if you don't have a profilometer, you can use your scleral lens as your topographer. And this is an example of a loose fitting lens, and fluorescein or lysamine green can be your guide to see where the exchange is coming in, where you can tuck that edge down. But in the next slide, you can see also where there is um, the compression patterns. So in the top picture, you can see just a mild compression pattern at 1 o'clock from 1 to o'clock. So that's suggesting some bearing, and you need to loosen that. And in the bottom right, you can see just a little bit of edge lift using fluorescein that's highlighting the edge of the lens. But on the left, you can see there's a lot of edge lift, there's air coming in. So again, while having a profilometer would be great in practice, it's not always possible. And lastly, we've got lots of di large diameter options. You can go spherical, but a lot of times you need to do asymmetric lenses, toric lenses, quadrant specific lenses are available, multi-meridional lenses are available in certain settings, pros is an option, as well as uh, the molding lenses um, as well. <clears throat> the, um, so there can be advantages and disadvantages to handling. An advantage is uh, that you don't have to be centered in, in when using a large diameter lens. You actually can be a little off center and the lens will go straight on and there shouldn't be any issues with bubbles. So I find that sometimes putting a large diameter lens can be easier and less bubble, uh, less issues with bubbles than using a small diameter lens, but obviously to have small apertures, that's a disadvantage. Other disadvantages are scleral obstacles, pinguaculae, symblephron, tubes and trabs, so they can get in your way, and this is where Dr. Wu is going to talk about some advantages of using those small diameter lenses as well. So this was just a fortunate accident. This patient uh, was fit with a 23 millimeter lens, lost to follow up for a while, and she came back, and lo and behold, she had a bleb. And thankfully, this lens was so large and vaulted nicely <laughs> that it accommodated the bleb just fine. So you can see in the upper left where that bleb is, and with the fluorescein, um, you know, the, the the bottom picture, you can actually see that there was this vaulting over the, the bleb space. So luckily, this patient um, went ahead without incident, even having a bleb that we didn't even know about. So in summary, selecting diameters is patient-specific and sometimes eye-specific. You could have a 14 millimeter in one eye and a 23 millimeter in the other eye. It really depends on what you're working with centrally and peripherally. Become familiar with all the designs that are commercially available to find out what's going to be the right match for your practice and the patients that you're seeing. Definitely work with fitting consultants. They are your right hand when it comes to new designs and never be afraid to ask for help. Well, thank you, Dr. Johns. That was fantastic. Just one quick question before we turn it over to uh, Dr. Wu. Somebody asked if you could elaborate on what the uh, pros lenses were that you mentioned a few slides ago. So pros lenses are uh, stand 
prosthetic replacement of the ocular surface ecosystem. Pros are actually fit at pros centers. I believe it's 12 centers across the country. Um, it originated at Boston sites. Uh, these, uh, if you end up having a patient that you're struggling with uh, challenging cases where commercially available lenses in your practice don't um, always work and you can't you can't troubleshoot the way you want. You can refer to a pros uh, doctor. They have, have uh, the 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 system is using fitting lenses, but it's a CAD CAM system based. But the other thing too is uh, iPrint Pro uh, is another option for you to use as uh, the molding, especially in these very challenging cases with tubes and trabs and various things. Um, both uh, modalities, while you might ha not have access to them in your own practice, you can refer to pay, uh, refer patients there for a scleral lens fit that um, might surpass some of the troubleshooting that you are capable of or you're limited by your design. Okay, great. And then great. I think with okay, that, thanks. we'll probably turn it over to uh, Dr. Wu. Thanks, Drew, and thanks, Lynette. That was excellent. I always learn so much whenever I hear about your amazing cases. So now we're just going to kind of switch gears and, and talk about some of the indications, some of the pros and cons, maybe some benefits of the smaller diameter lenses. So as we know, this is just a giant list of things that we already use scleral lenses for. We use them for a lot of different ectatic diseases, um, transplants, a lot of diseased corneas. And like Dr. Johns is an expert in ocular protection, so you have a lot of these, these really sick eyes, people that have Stephen Johnson, uh, pemphigoid, chemical burns, some of these limbal stem cell deficiencies, uh, lots and lots of different options as far as scleral lens designs go. And then also there's just a lot of reasons why we've been using it for comfort. So patients that work in dusty, windy environments, maybe they're not happy with their current contact lens design, or they can't achieve the comfort or vision. So there's so many different uh, indications for scleral lenses. A better question would be, what is it not indicated for? So I got this slide from Dr. Langis Michaud, who he is a, a big proponent of small diameter lenses. And I thought this was kind of funny that you know, you don't have to shoot a mosquito with a bazooka. So if you if you have a corneal condition and it can be fit with a, a smaller diameter lens, maybe we should try to use a lens with the lowest risk. We don't need to fit a microcornea with maybe a 22 diameter lens because of how much clearance there would be, how difficult it might be to insert. There's so many different reasons why we may not select a larger diameter lens. So just going with something that fits the eye, like Dr. John said, using a lens that is appropriate for that patient's condition, and every single patient is going to be different. Each eye might be completely different. So I'm just going to go through some of these different categories of some of the benefits of small diameter sclerals. So let's go through some of the candidates. So like we said, we know that Scleral lenses are used for regular corneas and diseased eyes, like dry eye syndrome. And some of the newer trends would be normal corneas. Patients that are reporting that their vision fluctuates throughout the day because of things like RK surgery, maybe post-LASIK surgery. Those have actually become some of my um, uh, best patients as far as good candidates go. Um, Oh, sorry, that would be an irregular cornea. But patients that have contact lenses, maybe they have a high amount of astigmatism and they're in a soft toric lens or maybe they're in a custom soft toric lens, but they still can't get that vision as sharp as they would really like. Sometimes a gas permeable lens or a scleral lens can certainly help them. Some of the patients in my practice that have Presbyopia also have a large amount of astigmatism. With soft lenses, we don't have that many options as far as just a standard soft contact lens, especially for patients that have high amounts of astigmatism. We've got a couple options now for soft lenses, and then for GP lenses, we've got lots and lots of options. 
And with scleral lenses, most all of the labs nowadays have a multifocal design. So it's, it's become a really great application in my practice for patients that have both presbyopia and large amounts of astigmatism. Also, patients that play sports, and this doesn't need to be professional athletes. This can just be, you know, even like your 16-year-old that has a very, very high prescription and needs to be able to see within 0.3 seconds of a baseball coming to them. Uh, it could be for adults uh, that want to play sports and they don't want to rely on goggles or they have too high of astigmatism to wear anything except their glasses or goggles and the, the contacts just don't work for them. That could be another option. And then some patients with, with allergies, and this could be seasonal allergies or this could be an allergy to silicone hydrogel, there's a lot of different reasons why we could use a scleral lens for normal corneas. One of the candidates I think of often are patients that have a high amount of hyperopia. These are patients that they, they have kind of those bug eyes when you look at them with their glasses on and you say, wow, your eyes are really, really big. Uh, those are some candidates for contact lenses and sometimes the soft contact lenses may not be comfortable, they might decenter. You might have to get them into something more, more custom for them to see better. So we've got some patients in our practice that have really high amounts of hyperopia, but the rest of their eye is quite normal and they do very well with scleral lenses. Same thing with myopia. So if you've got high, high, high amounts of myopia, of course, we've got soft lenses, we've got GP lenses, we've got hybrid lenses, we've got lots of options, but sometimes scleral lenses end up being the best option for, for these patients. I've got lots of patients where we've tried different options, we've tried different soft lenses, we've tried custom soft lenses, um, hybrid lenses, and nothing really works out for them, and a scleral lens ends up being the best option. So this is something that you might consider for your high myopes. Patients with astigmatism or even without astigmatism uh, could be a great candidate for scleral lenses. And I would say in, uh, in my practice, a lot of my patients have regular corneal astigmatism up to seven, eight, and nine diopters. And as you can imagine, getting a soft lens to, to have good vision and to fit well on the eye is very challenging. So for those patients, I am recommending a hybrid lens uh, a corneal GP, a bitoric, or sometimes the scleral lens ends up being the option. And what if they have residual astigmatism? So let's say they have six diopters of corneal cylinder, but in their refraction, they're coming up with nine diopters. Well, what happens to that other three diopters? The great news is now a lot of the labs, well, almost all of them, if actually probably all of them now, have the ability to add the front surface toricity to scleral lenses. I remember when sclerals were first kind of reintroduced to the market and nobody could add residual astigmatism. You had to just put it in a pair of glasses on top of the scleral lens. But nowadays, the labs have become so much more customized and they're able to add that technology. So if there's any residual astigmatism, that's not an issue. Anisometropia, just these are patients that, you know, they, they've got maybe three, four, five, six diopters of difference between the eyes and they don't adapt very well to glasses. It can help with image size, so not just scleral lenses, really any sort of contact lens can help with this, but some of my patients, they have these very crazy high prescriptions and the eyes are completely different, or it might be from um, some weird a disease that they have where it, this, a soft lens is not going to be an option. So anisometropia patients can also benefit from scleral lenses. And another benefit is that it might be covered under their medically necessary contacts. If you accept insurance in your practice, this could be a, a good option for them. Patients that wear corneal GPs, these are some of my favorite, favorite patients in my practice. But some of them have either heard from friends um, or they've read about them or they just want to know some different options uh, for, for their contacts. So some patients, they come in and we ask questions, how, how are your lenses doing? How is your vision? How's the comfort? How's your wear time? And some of the patients that wear GP lenses complain that they 
get stuff behind their lenses so they maybe work in a dusty or windy environment and when it gets behind the lens they have to take it out clean it put it back in and then go about their day with scleral lenses you don't have that foreign body entrapment so that's a huge benefit another one is dislodgement so patients that might complain that hey doc every time I look to the right really quickly my lens falls out they might be a good candidate for a scleral lens because those have very very low risk of popping out of the eye piggyback patients are some of my favorite patients to transition to scleral lenses because there's two reasons why we mostly use a piggyback number one is for comfort so we're putting that soft lens on and then the GP lens on top and also stability so if you're trying to center a lens a little bit better you might use a piggyback well sometimes patients can get frustrated with piggyback lenses because they're having to use different solutions they're having to replace the lenses on different programs you know some of them you know, replacing their GP lenses every year and then their soft lenses every day or every month depending on what lens they're using so changing them to a scleral lens can definitely help patients and it might be a little bit more convenient for them if they're willing to try also patients that are aphakic I have several aphakic patients in scleral lenses um, a lot of them were in soft lenses but it wasn't getting enough oxygen uh, to the cornea so they were develop developing some edema some of uh, my patients were getting some neovascularization and after switching them to scleral lens that uh, these these patients are actually doing much better and also aphakic patients if you accept insurance might be covered under their medically necessary benefits so another advantage like I said in a previous slide patients with presbyopia and astigmatism our options are kind of limited as far as contact lenses go but with scleral lenses that really gives us another option for patients that are needing and wanting some of that better near vision some other candidates would be patients that have dry eyes with soft lenses I've got some patients where we've tried every single soft lens under the Sun and they just cannot get comfortable with lenses and whether if it's an ocular surface issue or, or what have you some of these patients are very 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 motivated to get into a contact lens maybe they hate wearing their glasses maybe their glasses are just so thick and they just cannot wear them for their work environment there's so many reasons why patients want to be in contact lenses even if they're part-time wearers and scleral lenses may offer a good option for patients that might need something to, to help with the dryness because scleral lenses are filled with a liquid that that liquid reservoir that helps to bathe the cornea all day so it can provide some comfort and relief to some patients that have dryness when they wear their soft lenses other patients that I think of a lot are patients that are just not happy with the vision or the comfort they're getting with their soft torque lenses and this could be because the lens is rotated it could be because they the power is not completely exact to their needs and it could be because it just fluctuates you know throughout the day maybe as the lens gets drier it rotates or the lens material just kind of dehydrates so lots of patients that have normal corneas with um, where they're just not happy with their soft toric lenses could also be a good candidate for scleral I was involved with a study where we evaluated a mini scleral lens compared to a soft contact lens and it was at four different sites and basically the purpose of it was to validate the performance of a scleral lens in a group of subjects that had low to moderate astigmatism and the goal was to, to figure out whether a soft toric lens or a scleral lens would offer the best option for the correction of this astigmatism so basically what happened is we had patients 10 from each site and they were randomly assigned to group A or B with group A they wore the soft lens for a whole month first and then they wore the scleral lens for the second month and then for for group B they just wore the scleral lens first and then the soft toric lens second the lenses used were the Comfilcon A toric lens which is also known as the Biofinity toric and Tyro 97 14.3 millimeters scleral lens 
The results found were that comfort was similar with both lenses and there was no major difference at the end of the day. And I think that's a really important finding that with soft toric lenses, we know that they're very comfortable. We prescribe them every day for our patients. And the fact that a scleral lens has the same comfort and no difference at the end of the day is, I think, very, very profound. When the patients were asked to choose between the vision between the soft toric lens and the scleral lens, 75% of them said that they preferred the scleral lens for the vision. Then at the very end of the study, we did a forced choice where, it's, where we said, if you had to choose to stay in one lens forever, the soft toric lens or the scleral lens, which one would you choose? And 55% of them said that they would stay with that scleral lens. Another benefit to normal corneas is that they can definitely be easier to fit than diseased eyes. And I can certainly attest to this from patients in my chair, that normal corneas, they take very little time uh, for the most part compared to some of these diseased eyes. And I think that's because normal corneas have predictable shapes. Their eccentricity is pretty predictable. They're prolate, they're, um, the topography is quite normal. And that they don't have as much troubleshooting and complications going on. And that probably is because regular corneas are, are pretty healthy. With you, when you have a regular corneas, you've got corneas that are sick or, or eyes that are sick. So they might be producing more mucin. They might have more edema because of endothelial issues. And a lot of these disease eyes usually do not have the best tear film or, or lids for that matter. So when you're dealing with some of these more diseased eyes, it can definitely be more challenging. So some of the healthy cornea eyes are a lot easier to fit and they take way less time. So let's talk about handling. When we look at the two different lenses here, you can see a 14.9 diameter lens versus an 18.2 and the 14.9, they just might be more familiar to current contact lens wearers. Soft lenses, they kind of range between 14 to 14.5-ish. So 14.9 or 15 might not be a, that scary for a patient. When you start getting into the larger diameter lenses, 18, 19, 20, 22, some of these larger diameter lenses, sometimes patients are a little bit more apprehensive because they kind of get scared of the larger diameter. And just a quick case report, I had a patient, 15-year-old male, he came in because he had a unilateral corneal ectasia from an injury that he had. He had great vision in his right eye, poor vision in the left. You can see here he's got that ectatic kind of steep pattern on the left eye, almost looks like a keratoconus type patient. Um, so you can see the steepest points around 50 diopters, so not a, a super steep um, area, but still causing difficulty with his vision. With the refraction and a lot of astigmatism, we can get him down to 2060, uh, but I, I think we can do better. So first I tried a scleral lens, and I guess my first clue was that the insertion was extremely difficult and the patient was extremely scared. With that lens on, we, we, he could see 2025 with that lens. So I was super happy with the vision. His mom was extremely happy and the patient was very impressed. He had some issues inserting and removing the lens, but he really, really wanted to try. But at the follow-up, he still was not able to put in the contact lens. He was really scared to insert and remove the lens, and maybe that was just because he was a child, maybe it was because the lens was, was large or whatever the issue is, but he was not able to get that lens in. So then we tried a custom soft lens and ended up fitting him into a custom lens, and he can see about 2040. So even though the vision is not as good, you know, seeing 2025 with the scleral lens, but the fact that he could get the lens in and out, that, that's what was important to him and, and his mom. So sometimes you have these patients where the diameter or the insertion is, is an issue, so you might want to either change the diameter or cho change the, the fit completely. So next I want to talk about the, another benefit of small diameter lenses, which is the less optical decentration. 
This is a patient that's wearing a multifocal scleral lens in the left eye. You can see from those little hash marks, that's where the optical center of the lens is. And you can see that it is decentered inferior temporal. So this can definitely pose some problems, especially with multifocals, because if we're putting the this optics and we're, we're basing it on the center of the lens, the patient may not get into some of that near zone or distant zone, whatever zone it is, because of where the positioning is on, on their eye. And I know that that is something that a lot of labs are working on is decentered optics. But with, um, with smaller diameter lenses, it may help, and that might be just because of gravity, because the, the lens is not as heavy. And it might just be because of just the positioning of the lens as well. On some of these smaller diameter lenses, we can definitely achieve better centration a, a little bit easier depending on what the condition is. And this is another picture courtesy of Dr. Tom Arnold showing that this is a lens that is also decentered inferior temporally. And this is definitely a case, and I see this more and more in some of my larger diameter lenses, and it's sometimes it, it just has to be, you know, the way that the lens is, the condition that the patient has, the condition that the patient, whatever we're treating, sometimes we can't help that the lens decenters inferior temporal. But if it's causing a lot of vision issues, if you are able to, you might want to consider going to a smaller diameter lens. Another benefit to smaller diameter lenses is some of this posterior tear lens debris and some of this other reduced troubleshooting. Foggy vision is one of the most common complaints that we get fitting scleral lenses. And that can be from either the surface of the lens, maybe something's going on on the anterior surface as far as deposits or protein, um, maybe some moisturizers on the surface of the lens, maybe some lid issues, or it could be behind the lens. So in that interface between the lens and the cornea, there might be some issues of foggy vision there. With current literature, it, it does suggest that less than 200 microns over the corneal apex after settling can um, really help with some of this tear lens fogging. And I can definitely say that in clinical experience, when I'm fitting with smaller amounts of central clearance, there's less chance of posterior tear lens debris. But once again, you have to consider what type of patient you're fitting. If you're fitting a patient that has a very diseased eye that needs a very large diameter lens, you may not be able to fit them in a smaller diameter with less clearance. Chalasis is also something that's a hot topic in scleral lens research right now. You can see the, the different areas where the conjunctiva is kind of getting sucked up onto, um, into the lens. And there's some debate on if it's just a benign thing, you know, nothing to really worry about. But what they did find is in some patients, that chalasis actually sticks to and gets adhered to the front surface of the cornea and can cause some, some issues uh, down the line. So we definitely would like to try to eliminate chalasis or reduce it as much as possible. And one of the ways we might be able to achieve that is by having less limbal clearance. Um, and, just, and one of the ways you can do that is by decreasing the diameter. So if you are able to do that, then that might be advisable. Also, if you have too much vault, you can sometimes get this suction effect, and I, and I see this on some of my patients where we have to vault a, a very large amount because they have a very diseased cornea. And sometimes you get this kind of suction effect where you've got the, um, this outer edge kind of right outside of the limbus with this conjunctival area is kind of getting sucked up and a little bit too much uh, suction effect there, almost kind of like a vacuum causing some irritation. So this is one of my favorite lenses. Uh, Dr. Greg Denayer always lets me use this uh, this picture. I think it's really interesting and just kind of like a wow. This is definitely needs some adjustments. But sometimes with peripheral edge alignment, it can be a little bit more challenging with some of these larger diameter scleral lenses. And that's just that is because of some of the scleral shape issues that as you get further beyond the limbus, the scleral shape becomes more and more asymmetric, and that can be a little bit challenging when it comes to fitting some of these larger diameter lenses. 
Uh, here's a patient with a 14.5 diameter lens, and you can see even the blood vessels kind of all the way off onto the side are traveling under the lens quite nicely. You're not getting any areas of blanching, any areas of congestion. Um, you can see that the blood vessels are just traveling through underneath very nicely there. I'm just going to kind of uh, skip that part. Um, last thing I just wanted to mention is oxygen. Another hot topic in scleral lens research is how much oxygen is really getting to the cornea because you have to first go through the tear layer on the front, then through the actual scleral lens, then through the clearance, that, that chamber behind the lens, then you get to the cornea. So how much oxygen is, is really getting to the cornea? There's lots of theoretical oxygen delivery models out there, and a lot of them have been published in some of these major literatures. And basically what the suggestion is, is to, is to get, get scleral lenses with the highest decay material possible and also minimize the amount of central clearance as much as we can and making the lenses not very thick. So we don't want these super, super thick scleral lenses with lots of this plasticky type material that doesn't allow oxygen in um, as well as just the normal tear film. So it's just important to kind of keep that in mind if oxygen is, a, is an important role in, in scleral lens fitting and something that we're going to keep discovering more and more. So how big should a lens be? Like Dr. John said, you just you need to know the design that you're working with and what complications you can expect. Um, just going through the with your patient and holding their hand through this whole process can really help. If you have to go to a larger diameter scleral lens, just educating them on on what to expect and how you're going to help them and how you're going to help them succeed can really really help things. And then under, understanding that disease that you are fitting, whether it's a normal cornea or if it's a diseased eye, can really, really help you. And maybe a recommendation that we had uh, to practitioners is possibly maybe owning both a large diameter scleral lens set and a small set because one size does not fit all. All right, well, thank you very much, Dr. Wu. Fantastic. We do, we do have a few questions here. Uh, we'll start with, uh, uh, if you have a patient where IOP is of concern, has there been any data that supports uh, an advantage with larger or smaller diameter scleral lenses? So right now the hot topic is IOP, and there's a lot that we need to learn. Uh, Dr. Michaud published a paper that looked at a small group of patients fit with, uh, I believe, a 15 Eight and an 18.2 around the diameters. Um, he found that on average there was a five millimeter uh, increase of pressure in both cases, so diameter was irrelevant. But um, we have to caution you on these manuscripts. It's small sample sizes. The way that they're measuring the IOP, you can't measure the IOP with the gold standard when the lens is on. So in this, they were using transpalpebral uh, way of measuring the IOP uh, with the lens on. So again, there's some limitations there, but we still need a lot. Uh, we need to learn a lot. So again, just proceed with caution. I don't know the answer. Uh, Dr. Wu, any thoughts? No, that's all great, uh, Dr. Johns. You're exactly right. That's a huge hot topic right now, IOP with scleral lenses. And I just think that as research comes out more and more, we'll, we'll find out more. When the patient being fit is being fit unilaterally, does that have uh, any bearing on the diameter of the lens you might choose based on either cosmesis or eye health? Um, I guess I would say that, yes, it, you don't want to go super large or super steep. Uh, like Dr. John said, you can actually get scleral lenses really and, and kind of steepen them or flatten them depending on what you're trying to do. But some of my patients that have really steep fits, their eye can look a little bit different and their eyelid positioning can look a little bit different. Um, so if I would say if you can... I would try to go smaller if because then the eyes will kind of look the same, but it depends on the condition. You know, if they've got keratoglobus or some proud graft and you have to go larger, you're not really going to be able to 
uh, avoid that. But if if possible, I would say going smaller would be your best bet. Uh, not knowing any any uh, anything else about the case, uh, Dr. Johns, any other comments? Yeah, I agree. In a case like that, the lids, uh, you get a lid lift with a scleral lens, so that's an actual nice perk about them. Um, in some cases, you might actually fit the other eye with the same diameter lens, whether it's, whether it's medically indicated or not, because in some cases, because you're fitting one eye, you can get induced prism just by the decentration of the lens itself. So the patient might have some um, asthenopia. And so in those cases, uh, changing the diameter, trying to get it to center better can help. Otherwise, just go ahead and fit both eyes because they're going to decenter the same and uh, the patient won't notice that visual difference is something I've encountered. And then well, what diameter would you recommend when fitting over blebs or filtration devices? <laughs> That's a tricky question. So um, just because my patient showed up with a bleb, would I encourage everybody to fit super large to fit over it? You have to try on lenses and see. A lot of times I will go very small and try and fit inside of it. And in some cases, I'll actually fit corneal scleral because I'd rather take the risk of bearing a little bit more on the cornea than actually impinging into a tube that could risk uh, an erosion because tubes can erode on their own. They're fragile. So we don't need to add any impingement or plastic that can rub into that area as well. So in those cases, it's a case-by-case -case situation where you have to really assess the eye and see what you're comfortable watching and, and fitting. I don't know. Dr. Wu? And then yeah, I, I just wanted to. Earlier, or anything oh, else? Sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to add that um, I would totally agree with Dr. Johns. I try to fit inside if I can. I I'll try doing a, a corneal GP if you know if there's a bleb or or a shunt or something trab something because I don't want to touch that area if I don't have to. But if nothing is going to work, um, there's a lot of different options as far as notching and using different. Uh, systems. Every, each lab has a different way of kind of doing different edge lifts in certain areas and that's going to I think become one of the standards moving forward is having the ability to kind of vault over some of these conjunctival obstacles but you have to be really careful when you're doing that because if the patient doesn't put it in right or if it settles too much over time you might erode part of the bleb and, and create a leak and that's like the worst case scenario. So if you are going to do that, that's something that needs to be monitored. And then finally, you showed a slide earlier uh, where the, the optical center of a lens was marked. Are there any lenses out there you know of with um, the diagnostic lenses that have optical center markings on them? I am, you know, I the, the one that was on the slide was, um, that was from Valley Contacts, the custom stable. So that they definitely have the center marked. And I know a lot of the other labs, they actually have um, like the limbal areas marked. They have the mid peripheral areas marked. They have the edge areas marked. So there are some some labs out there that that have the the center marked. But uh, I'm trying to think of anyone else offhand, and I'm not 100% certain. Dr. Johns. I. Uh, I can't think of it either, but this is where you talk to your, your the lab that you use. If you're getting new, uh, getting started with scleral lenses, use your GP lab that you're used to. Most of the labs have their own scleral design. Talk to them, see if they have a multifocal lens, and see if their optic zone is marked. Do you guys have any issue with lenses that lightly touch the superior limbus if they're just decentering inferiorly? I, I can start and take that. Um, it, it, it depends on how you fit the lens. One thing that I'll tell you is that if you add scleral uh, peripheral um, uh, toricity or quadrant specific curves, you can actually get the lens to center better. Because sometimes if the lens is, if the eye is toric, the lens may teeter downward and and decenter and touch the superior uh, 
uh, nasal aspect. One thing that I'm very, I'm not as concerned about is if the patient, uh, I see the that contact in primary gaze, but when I have the patient look down, if the clearance ends up, you're seeing fluorescein come in, you know that when the patient's using eye movement, fluorescein, or uh, they're getting some vaulting in that area. Um, the other thing too is for me, I really only get concerned is when I take the lens off, if I see staining in that area. If I don't see any staining or any, um, neo or any inflammation or, or hyper uh, hyperemia leading up to that area, I'm much less concerned. Yep, totally agree with Dr. Johns. Beautiful. Well, thank you guys so much for, for a wonderful lecture.